My name is Anthony DeGraw. I got my good friend, Tony Miller. I'm the chief revenue officer over at Integris. He is our chief information officer. We have a couple different angles that we wanted to talk to you on today. But the first angle we wanted to talk to is what is going on in the world of chief financial officers? One, how are we engaging with them as Integris? What are they looking for? What are their concerns? How do we help them strategize? And then I brought Tony on because he engages with our CFO for all of Integra, 650 plus folks, probably 20 plus locations, three time zones. So there's certain ways he approaches a long-term strategy with our CFO and how they plan together to push our organization forward. So that's the overall topics of what we're going to hit on. Before we get into it, Tony, do you want to say any good words? Where you're calling in from? Where do you live in this digital world? Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm in Denver. I've been part of Integris for a year and a half now. And uh, I come from the MSP space. I built my whole career around, around what we do. So I've worked with all the kinds of clients, small ones, big ones, financial institutions, banks, law firms construction sites, you name it. And so I've done that, this kind of stuff for a long time, but yeah, I live in Denver. I'm not far from our Denver office and I'm actually at home right now. Awesome. We're talking about the setups, the office setups, home office setups and getting those virtual backgrounds going. Yeah. All right, let's jump into it. So the first question we wanted to touch on is some of the pressures that CFOs find themselves under. When they're looking at IT overall, their infrastructure, their providers, internal teams, external teams, and whatnot. So I was going to start with, I literally got off a call, I think a few days ago, with the CFO of a company that has both what I would call more warehouse workers, contractors, service type of folks. They have about 300 of them. And then they had about 300 computer users. So a total of about 600 folks and the needs for those users, whether you're just out in the field working or if you're behind an office setup are completely different. And as we got to the end of the call, he answered this question directly. So my gut says that he and other CFOs have all the following concerns. And I literally have the list written down from this call. Number one, I need to be as secure as possible. First thing on the top of his mind. Number two, which I think we could go a little bit deeper on, is I do not want to get in trouble with the board of directors. I do not want to go to a quarterly board meeting and have to talk about an incident, a breach, a sending of money to a fraudster. That is the last thing I want to do because it's on my head. Number three, I want a quick response. And number four, I have some large customers, Verizon, AT&T, they're my customers and they're putting specific demands on us to keep the business, therefore the revenue that's associated with them. Tony, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about those four. Let's dive deep into those. Number one, secure as possible and how a CFO should think about. It. Yeah. First, I want to like quick touch on just the CFO, the fact that the CFO is the person you talk to most often the financial institutions, if we go way back into the nineties, were the or financial departments were the first adopters of technology, right? They were like, oh my gosh, something like an Excel spreadsheet is way better than this big general ledger book. And that has carried on for the last 30 years that CFOs or controllers or whatever are often our contacts at companies and have the highest level of responsibility towards technology for that company. That said, CFOs grew up doing numbers. They started out as staff accountants and they, they worked their way up into a CFO. That is their world. And they, but they are still somehow responsible for the technology of a company. That's a large company. You mentioned 600 people. And that CFO doesn't know the ins and outs and the bits and bytes of, of everything that is technical. And but that responsibility is still theirs. And that's when they come to companies like Integris and say, please help. This is what I need. And they start talking about security. Again, it's a gray area. Just talking about EBITDA percentages to some of our techs is a gray area. They might have a vague idea about what the acronym means, but they sure don't know the ins and outs, whereas the CFO does. 
our techs do know the ins and outs about security and technology and efficiencies you can gain there. So CFOs are always in a weird position there. Um, they're all almost always very smart people, so they know a lot. And I think it's our job to just translate what we know to what they know because they're smart. They're going to get it when we explain to them the ins and outs. Security is the one that is on so many people's minds that they all CFOs have either dealt with or know somebody who dealt with the bad wire funds or, you know, the other things that can happen, the other types of incidences. And security is real. Like they have to be dealing with it. And it's something we have to deal with. If you use a computer, you must deal with security of one sort of another. But security is, a, is its own field. It's complicated. And it's never one thing. If you remember back to 2001, you had a good antivirus, security high five, right? Like you did it. But now it's user training, it's DNS filtering, it's, and it's a list of things. And um, it's not just the firewall. It's because now your people are at their own homes, right? Or yeah. working remote. You mentioned the field workers. Those guys are out there probably tied to a hotspot on their cell phone or a dedicated device. How do we protect them? But there are methods, right? These are things that, that we study and learn about it and find the best way to implement for our clients and ourselves. Every day we're working on those things and it is an ever evolving thing. So what we may have been recommending even just 18 months ago may pivot and we may need to actually adjust to the current landscape of the internet. Absolutely. You know, there is real, their concern is real and it's our job and our VCIO's jobs to, to work with our clients who are our point of contact, who are CFOs to help them understand that. And of course, for CFOs, everything also gets translated into dollars, right? And we have to help them understand why this does indeed cost money and the cost to not doing the security. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll answer in the second part here, how we help them address that or take that pressure off, especially around security, but just the quick insights, which we'll get into, which is to me, it's education, confidence, and then roadmaps. Because I think if we communicate it in those three, it takes some of that pressure off of them and they know they're going in the right direction. Next one was the board of directors. Avoiding the scare, the meeting, the potential issues there. How are you, let's look at even just Integris, how are you helping our CFO navigate those conversations with the board of directors. You're part of the conversation with the board of directors. What, what should CFOs be thinking in that realm if it is just them? Yeah. Our CFO does take the easy road and makes me talk to the board of directors, but often a CFO needs to report on what the status is, what he's doing, what he's outsourced, what he's done internally to, to protect the company. This gets into documenting it and say, hey, here's the things I've done. Some, some industries have compliance requirements. And so it's, hey, here's how I've met our compliance requirements that do relate to security. Some compliance is non-security related, the security related things. Or here's, if we don't have a compliance, here's what we've done to match some of the other compliances. So, so we're putting our best foot forward. We're giving ourselves the best chance as we navigate the digital world, right? That's so having something to present a list, a tactic, a roadmap of what we're doing as a company, having that as a CFO, when you go talk to the board is what the board wants. And that's what I've done, right? When I go to a board meeting, this is what I'm doing to protect us. Um, nothing is foolproof. That's if anybody says that, that's not true. We're doing everything we can and here's the everything. Absolutely. Next one on the list was quick response. So the way I go on this or the route I go on this, I think what he was talking about is keeping my people up and running productive. If something happens, how do we handle a quick response? How, how can you give me confidence that you guys, whether it's internal, external are engaging and giving me my, my, my people a quick response. Obviously the best response is when you don't need one, right? Everything's working well and You've given us the freedom to really make your systems run well. After that, this, the teams we build are intended to, 
to be able to address issues, whether they're actually security related or just an application not working, a service or a server not responding. And so we as a company do a lot of things to make it so that we often know about things before the client does, right? And this is the monitoring that we have in place. And so sometimes we're responding before you even know there's a problem and you may call in and talk to somebody, but behind the scenes, somebody's already working on things. That's the best case scenario. We can't monitor everything. Our clients, a CFO may have outsourced to a third party accounting vendor. And while we can't control their servers and we can't monitor their servers, we can do all the things and in, in interface with them to get updates and stuff like that. But, but that's the gist of it. It's not one quick thing to monitor the stuff, have the staff to pre prepare to respond and start working before the clients even know there was a problem. Absolutely. I love that. Some of the best examples we've been on is something goes down overnight. We were already on it, fixed it. And first thing in the morning, we communicate that message over of, Hey, this happened last night. I just want to make you aware of it. And by the way, it's been completely fixed. You're good to go. And that's wow. Let me throw another quick item in there. That is something that the CFOs can do now. Often the big things we talk about the big things, right? Like a server down or that kind of, that story is great, but sometimes it's his AP person they, their computer's not working today, right? They come in in the morning and hardware failure happens. CFOs can be prepared for that scenario. That usually has a an expense, right? Like having redundant hardware sitting around on the shelf. Nobody likes having a computer not doing stuff and paying money for that. But in, if you're a CFO watching this and you're like, I can't have my AP clerk down for 12 hours, have extra equipment. Like we, we can get that equipment set up and running for them. Um, and you talked about that example of the 600 person company, 300 in the field. If those field people need gear and field people are hard on equipment, right? Yeah. They, then having a handful of those sitting around is really key for continual operation, right? Because the CFO has to talk to the COO and go, and the COO is going, my people can't do their job. And the CFOs, I, I do numbers like, and, but just having the equipment there, um, help solve that. It's a redundancy that we have built in on the back side of a lot of things, but companies don't always have built in on the front side, the front lines. Yeah. Great tip. I absolutely love that. I started to speak more and more about the need to do that, right? If you have an employee, like you're saying that if they go down, it's going to be a problem for a day and you're waiting on hard and we have drop shipping now. We got all kinds of stuff we can do, but the best sort, the best case is to have one unified a business laptop or business desktop, have a unified okay. solution that's the same across the board, number one. And then number two, have a few extras on hand. That way our team can get you up and running as quick as possible. Great recommendation. Final one on here was third-party vendor requirements or your client's requirements, right? In this example, I used AT&T and Verizon. They have some big names, but you can even use smaller names that are requiring you, the clients of yours, they're requiring you to stay, get to a certain standard, or they're requiring you maybe not to meet a regulatory framework, but they're going to ask you 250 questions every single quarter, and they're going to verify you're doing those things. What's your thought process on that and the additional requirements that continue to come down the Yeah, that's a Take away technology for a second. It's like that's a change is happening in the business landscape where in a B2B relationship, requirements are being made of companies to meet something like whether that's a security requirement or a process requirement. And we're now all working together and working with each other to, to meet those requirements. So if, if I'm the vendor for somebody and they're expecting a thing from me, where it could be a full compliancy, like a SOC 2, or it could just be a, hey, I need you to sign something that says you do these 10 things. We all have to work with each other. Like business to business relationships now include that kind of interaction. That maybe wasn't the case 40 years ago. It was a little while ago in the finance space, and it's now reached the technical space. We usually talk about that in terms of compliancy. And it usually looks something like they're doing work for somebody that that third client now down the row has expectations of our client. And now we have to meet the technical needs 
of that ask. And when that happens, the answer is work with us. And if they know that there's things coming, we can be proactive about that. We can actually execute on things that they know are coming in advance, whether they're compliance related or just questionnaires that they're required to fill out. It needs, and this is something for a CFO too, it needs to be budgeted for. These things almost always cost money, right? Yes. right? We're, it, you think about a SIM, right? A, a SIM isn't something that everybody thinks, oh, I got to have a SIM. Like you think you have to have AV or an EDR solution. A SIM is all about logging and keeping track of all this data. That's not something people think of right away, but that's coming in these requirements. Like what is your SIM solution? And those have costs, not only to maintain them, but to set them up and then just the licensing fee. So a CFO or any company, whether it's the CEO, the CFO, or maybe they have their own technical person, they need to be budgeting for this kind of stuff, trying to look into the future. What kind of requirements are coming up to me, whether they be compliance or other, and how do I meet those requirements and budget for them? Because unfortunately they do cost money. Yeah. Even time, right? We started to see in our own business, we lived for a while in this gray area. Uh, our virtual CIOs would hand would help handle the insurance at the cyber insurance application. They help answer those questions. They'd help answer the smaller third party vendor risk assessment. And it was in this kind of gray time of do we do it? Do we not do it? How do we help? And always lending an extra hand. Now, to your point, budgeting for it. These things are going out to 250, 500 questions. They're extremely complex. There may be 15 of them now, 10 of them, five of them. Right. There's a lot of time that it takes to do this. And that's what almost what helped drive the creation of our virtual chief information security officer offering was because that gray started to get really black and white. Of yeah. Should we, who should do this? What certifications do they need? What knowledge do they have? And where should that go? Tony mentioned there are additional tool sets that are probably needed for some of these requirements, but there's also a different, a completely different skill set level now that's needed to answer some of this stuff. Yeah. I was going to also mention our VCSO, the ability for us to help them in the CISO space through the VCSOs. They, as a company matures in their security side, it's not a, it's not a light switch, right? It's you're working towards something. As they continue to mature, I would also say our clients should have requirements of their vendors as well. It's not just something, and it's something we've done and something we can help our clients with too, is saying, if we're going to use somebody as a vendor, they must meet a certain set of requirements. And without thinking about a vendor, we sit down and say, what is important to us? And it might be a compliance thing. It might be the way that they share data with us. Hey, sit down and actually make your own kind of core values. <laughs> like what is important? To you? Even if you don't have the government telling you in terms of compliance, what's significant to you? And that's the kind of stuff we can help. And then you start to vet your vendors, not just your clients and say, okay, so that happened just the other day. There was a request to work with a new vendor inside our own company. That request came to one of our teams and we sat down and we have our checklist and we said, they check, check. Okay. They meet our values and therefore, yes, this is a good company for us to work with. And we moved forward and now we're working with them. And that gets technical. Like some of those things are technical, like how they transfer information. We're analyzing their API and stuff like that. But, but still, that's all possible. And it's one of those things we can help companies define. Yeah. I, it's something I still forget, right? I think of when you explain that, I think of reactive versus proactive. And the reactive is keeping my clients happy and making sure I'm doing what they need of me so I can keep that revenue and relationship healthy. Um, but yeah, the proactive side of that is you going downstream. Who are you working yeah. with? Because at the end of the day, you could take all of our recommendations in the world, you could put everything in place, but if that vendor has access into your systems or your data and they're the weakest link, but you're going to be in a painful situation and scratching your head because you did everything that you could. So yeah, there's definitely that proactive approach that needs to start to, to turn the corner for the others. Popular example of that is, is Target had an incident years ago yeah. where it was their HVAC guy. Like they didn't bet something there and it was an HVAC guy that created the security. And they were probably spending what a million to $10 million on every advanced cybersecurity tool and team and all that, that they could possibly have. But the HVAC guy came in and connected. That's it. <laughs> 
All right. So those are the four items. The next question is how do we help them take the pressure off in these four areas and provide higher level strategy and KPIs? So I'll start with number one, which is the secure as possible. And I think some of these answers may be duplicated in my response. I'm looking to get Tony's feel on this too, but secure as possible. So Integris recently had a framework that we were working off of ourselves internally, but never publicly declared it. It was more in the one-to-one -one conversations, but we recently named it, called it Responsible IT Architecture or Rita for short. And that responsible IT architecture has, I, I believe, nine total elements to it. And not every element is a tool, by the way. So some of the elements are simple checkboxes or things that you need to do. So when I think about the CFO saying to me, like, hey, we need to be as secure as possible. My first question is, how do you stack up against Rita or our responsible mm -hmm. IT archi architecture framework? And that just really being the baseline, I think, I forget how we define it, but we state something of this is the base. This is the minimum standards that you need to have in place as an organization in 2023. Are there 500 other things you could be doing? Absolutely. But let's make sure we have this foundation and base in place. Tony, I don't know your thoughts on this, but when I think as secure as possible, first thing I go to is a responsible IT architecture and making sure that foundation is correct. Yeah. And I like our friend Karis's example of the seatbelt, right? Like, like the responsible IT architecture is a seatbelt, right? Like it's not the securest thing ever. You want the securest thing ever. That's, that's airbags. That's roll cages. Like you can go on and on. And I also like to push back on a, on somebody who asks me for secure as possible. Is a spectrum, right? It, there's just the baseline. There's nothing, and that should never be anybody. But there's the baseline. That's the, what we call responsible IT architecture. And then there's, you know, man, what the NSA does. And the, those are very locked down. And, but the other side of that coin is also usability, right? And the user experience while doing that. And so as somebody who is responsible for security and responsibility for the functioning of the technology within our company, I do have to balance those things too, right? And I have to have, and the third item there is cost, right? So a CFO is actually juggling all three of those. I can go make a computer extremely secure. We have one client who had a need to go secure as possible. And we actually took that computer offline. Like that computer is not even on the internet, right? That's secure as possible. But you can imagine the, the average office user not having access to the internet. That's a, that creates a workability problem, right? They're unable to do their job. So, that, so there's the balance there. And so they're always trying to figure that out. What I like to do for us and what I think everybody should be doing is, yes, you want to be as secure as possible right up until you, you've damaged operational efficiency, right? And then you're working together, CFO, CIO, COO, like having conversations about the money, the operations, the security, and figuring all that stuff out. Um, I like to push it as far as I can as well. I get that question, make us secure as possible. Okay, go. I'm like, all right, but then I got to spend this money, right? Now I got a budget for it. Okay, so next year, let's put this in the budget because we're going to go the next step and we're going to continue to get better and better every day. Because like I said, every six to 18 months, this is, I have to adjust. And that's what our clients should expect is that we're going to adjust for them. But again, that's new expenses, that's new changes in processes and procedures. And, and so it's an ever-changing thing and it also is a balancing act the whole time. So when they say secure as possible, I get it. We're going to make you as secure as you can afford and as secure as your operations will allow. It's our job, both our VCIOs and our VCSOs, to push that beyond sometimes what our clients are comfortable with. For it to be this secure, now not only do I have to log in, I have to do an MFA. That was one that for a while people were like, Ah, that's a pain in the butt. I left my phone over there. I don't want to. Okay, I technically affected operational efficiency, but it's a must-have right now. MFA. Like, no. I created some inconvenience for the individual using the computer, but we can't operate today with that. And so, it, there's a little bit of a balancing act there. I said, yeah, yeah that's kind of. I'm it's, sorry. It's, that to be it's, yeah, it's interesting how you mentioned that too, right? And not too long ago, and depending on who you asked, MFA was one of those things that like, oh, I should be considering it for it, but I don't need to do it right this second. 
And now, you know, not, yeah, not too long later, it's no, you can't even be a client of Integris if you don't have factor across right. everything. Right. That's so, why we've put it in. We've put it into the responsible IT architecture, right? Exactly. That's now the minimum requirements. So yeah. Awesome. And SIM might be there in the future. SIM, I don't believe is part of our responsible IT architecture, but it's something we offer because it is a requirement for some people today, yeah. a necessity. I don't think it's long before that's everybody's yeah. going to need that as part of the day. Absolutely. All right. Next one, taking the pressure off of the board of directors and the scorecard, or what does that look like? When I go this way, I think very clearly of providing where are we at today, where are our gaps, and then how are we going to accomplish those gaps? And I always speak in quarters, so it, over the next quarter, right? And then, Tony, to your point, and what is our budget for the next quarter, for the next three quarters, for this year? So ideally, you're going into a new year with an understanding of what what needs to be accomplished to keep yourself out of trouble and get your, and keep yourself up to date. And then you're breaking down that each quarter. So the way we can take pressure off CFOs, which in whether depending on the size of the business, but we do see this across a lot, that there is no roadmap. There are no bu budgetary items, right? Every what I see them get the most frustrated with when we talk to them is everything's an unexpected expense. And that is extremely frustrating for them. And what I, what, the reason I love working with the financial side of the house, could be a controller, could be a CFO, could even be an office administrator, is that we can show them like, no, this is what you need to plan for next year. And we can stay within that as long as you allow us to operate. And then all of a sudden it's, oh yeah, I could set aside that amount of money. I can budget for that. And then you guys can get done what you need to get done. So that's what I've seen the most there is, especially with the board of director, directors, is everybody just wants clarity of where are we at today? What are our highest priorities? And how are we going to get those accomplished in the next 30, 60, 90 days? Yeah, as you were talking about how do we help the board of directors don't like surprises, right? They've got a responsibility to the health of the company, financially and operationally and reputationally. But also technically and from a security angle, they just don't like surprises. Nobody likes surprises either. So the roadmap, you, you said that, hey, as you were talking at the beginning, I was just like, hey, we got to get to the roadmap. Like we got to get to planning and executing on the plan. That, that's the solution there. Awesome. Next one was the quick response. And you mentioned this as we were covering it which is how do we help them with quick response? And I think the biggest thing is taking the recommendations and implementing them. If it means having a couple spare business laptops off to the side, because that's going to get you the quickest response, well, let's do it. Um, mm -hmm. If that means we need to update your 2003, 2008, or 2012 server, there's a reason we're giving you that recommendation. Because if it goes down, the impact to your business is high. At least for Integris, I know we constantly try to communicate in terms of business impact. So it's relative to the folks on the other side and it's not just tech speak. But to me, the quick response is um, your environment up to standard, allowing us the ability to bring the tool sets we need to bring to do the job the right way. It's another big one. I like to say we want a whole, we want you to hold us accountable for three things, response, service, cybersecurity, patching and monitoring. We want you to hold us accountable for that. But in order to hold us fully accountable, you've got to let me bring my tools to the table. I don't know how you think about that, Tony. Yeah, no, it, you're spot on about the, if people want quick response, they actually have to have resilient systems, right? And that, that means they're prepared for stuff. But response is a bummer, right? We're all glad we've got fire departments, but first we put drywall in, right? Then we quit using blankets to call them fire. Let us do those things. That's the things. Yes, we've got the fire department and yes, it's going to respond as quick as possible. And, but let's, let us do the, let us do this stuff before so that we don't even have to get to the response. And you mentioned up-to-date systems that I just want to reiterate that because, because if somebody is saying to me, I need any quick response, uh, sometimes that does mean that they've got a lot of junk back in the server room <laughs> and they're like, I want you to just keep my junk up and running. But if they really do care about uptime and being able to continue to keep the company running, and that's why they're saying you got to be able to respond quick. Cause when stuff goes down, I need you to respond quick. 
what if we actually just make it so that you, we don't have to respond as often? And not everybody thinks that way, but I, I think the more companies we can help them to understand that and give us the freedom and budgets and plans to execute on that stuff, the less that the response time even becomes a conversation. Yeah. The, uh, I think of some situations where it's my hardware, my employees are working off a of seven, eight, 10 year hardware and trying to keep up with the systems of today. It's just not working. And so somebody in our organization likes to say it a lot. And it sounds funny when it comes out of his mouth, but it's, we can't turn water into, there's a certain point in time where we just, we can't make this laptop work any better than it is. It's just old and it needs to be refreshed. It's a perfect example. Turning water into wine is impossible for the integrity folks. And, and you may have some honest conversations about that. And then finally was, uh, how do we take the pressure off with the regulations, the frameworks that are out there, the third party vendor requirements that keep coming down. As you mentioned, the ability to then go to your customers and go deal with them and their requirements. We answered this, right? For us, it's a VCSO engagement. That stands for Virtual mm -hmm. Chief Information Security Officer. If you have a framework or a regulation that you need to comply with, that's the best way to help you get there. If you don't have one, but you'd like to match to one, as Tony, Tony mentioned, there's a few out there that are really good frameworks that it doesn't matter if you're a small private business or you just don't have a framework that you need to comply with. There's a few out there that you can go after. Um, then the final piece of this is what I like to say a lot of the times too, is some of the coolest ways I've seen organizations that work with us handle these frameworks or the cybersecurity piece of this, the compliance side is they use it to their advantage in a marketing scheme which to me is super cool. Like to me, we use the term operational maturity. The businesses using compliance as a marketing tactic or a sales tactic to grow their organizations, I think is huge. I've seen this, I'll give you two or three different references I have on this right now. One is a larger-ish law firm here in the Northeast. And strategically, I saw them go after SOC. I think it was SOC 2 type 2. And strategically, they blasted out to all their customers, all their referral partners, and they said, hey, we just want to let you know that the law firm has just become this. It's vitally important to us and our clients, and we want you to know that if you partner with us, we're putting our money where our mouth is in terms of protecting you and your data. Thought that was super cool, but they were more of a regional larger player that could do that. Another interesting example, I believe it was a small law firm, five to 10 folks out of, I think, Nashville. I want to say it was somewhere down in the Southeast. And what they found themselves was in a very specific area of practice um, that they had some expertise in. However, the law firms that they were competing against were more like the first law firm I mentioned, bigger regional or even national providers that had the ability to build out that area of practice. So what they strategically did was, hey, we know who our competition is. Why don't we double down on the cyber and the compliance and show that we've engaged a VC cell in a capacity right. and use that to prove to our clients, which were mostly Fortune 500, even though they were a smaller law firm, that we can do the same thing they can do. And they actively use that to compete against a larger law firms and organizations there. So I gave two law firm examples. I'm sure this is being done in other industries. But the answer is, how can we take this off? We can engage our VC and, uh, and then we can also help you strategically use that to your advantage. Tony, I don't know if you've seen, where have you seen this work in terms of the compliance regulations? Yeah, I really like your stories of how they're using it from a marketing standpoint. That's not my day-to-day -day world, but I'm involved in businesses, right? And it, it is... It's an angle that matters to a lot of people, even if it's not being pushed upon you by the government to say, hey, I have met this certain standard, um, really can work in your advantage when prospecting clients or just trying to even play with the big boys. In your example, there are other organizations that, that this stuff is mandatory and they have to do stuff. And so you can think of small manufacturing that that has some government regulations. And it's maybe that may, they might be two or three 
uh, subcontractors down the line, right? Their customer is not the United States government. It's this other machine shop or this other manufacturer. And all of a sudden these things start to apply and maybe they get far enough down the food chain that, that it's not, it's not required of them. But I can tell you that if, if your customer has those requirements, they're going to want them from, if they've got three different vendors to choose from, and one of them also is voluntarily meeting those requirements, that's a heck of a competitive advantage in any landscape, whether that's law firms or machine shops that are working with big manufacturers. All these things apply. And you used the word op operational maturity earlier. That is a mature company, a company that has said, hey, we're going to step up our game because the compliance thing sometimes just feels like overlords. But the truth is it, it makes you a better company. When you meet regulatory compliances, you are often more secure. You are running in a more mature way. And usually more mature companies make more money, right? And businesses are in the business of making money. So there's advantages to being operationally mature. I hold us to a few other standards, some other frameworks that we're not required to have. We don't even, maybe we should start using some of them in our own marketing. But we do some things that aren't required of us just because they're good practice. It makes us more mature. Your laptop, Anthony, has things on it that, that nobody told us we have to do. But I know yeah. it's good practice for us to do so that we are as secure as possible. Yeah, in the example you gave. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, we're doing a couple, two more questions in the CFO realm, and then we're going to go. We have another topic Tony and I are going to touch on. Okay. But the team wanted to touch around the IT assessments and cyber gap analysis that we typically do or start most of our, what I would call relationships with. It's To me, it's a really good place to start in terms of a, a partnership or even just a model into like, where are we today? So for instance, the CFO that I we talked about earlier that I spoke to a few days ago, he has a combo of things going on. And I'm just going to use him as an example because it resonates with a lot of folks out there. Number one, he has a director of IT or an internal IT employee that he employed. They also employ a managed service provider outside of that director of IT. So you may have both, you may have one or the other, doesn't really matter. But the common statement that we hear is, I don't even know where I am today. Or why is my insurance company telling me I need multi-factor authentication and not my employee or not my managed service provider? We don't have a budget. We have no idea what we're going to spend even next month. On I and I'm scared of the multiple surprises that may be coming my way. I just say I use it as like they're just running blind. And as Tony mentioned, built and brought up in that accounting and how to do all of that, not necessarily brought up in how to do IT and cybersecurity, but smart enough to fully understand that they're not seeing that direction and not getting that strategy. So to me, the assessment and cyber gap analysis that we do gives you two different things. On the cyber side, it points out all those gaps and it compares them directly to business impact. So is this high impact, medium impact, or low impact? And when I say impact, I try to standardize that more into time down, right? Am I going to be down for seven days, five days, or one day, or, or some variation of those? So that's how I think about cyber, a cyber impact and those tool sets and the gaps that potentially exist. The other side of it I talk about on the IT side is that hardware, software, lifecycle management, meaning what do I have in my environment today? How old is it? Is it under warranty? Is it not under warranty? Is it end of life? Is it end of support? There's all these types of terms that go and float around that you probably have no visibility into. So that to me is the best place for most organizations to start is to bring somebody from the outside in. Integris does this ourselves too, by the way. We eat our own dog food. We bring companies in from the outside to fully evaluate everything that to Tony's doing and that we're doing as a company. And it costs us tens of thousands of dollars to do this year in and year out. But best practice, bring somebody in from the outside, have them fully evaluate your network um, and your IT infrastructure and give you that roadmap that you've been looking for. Especially if you're saying, I don't know when I'm going to spend. I have no strategy. 
if those things are the things that you're thinking of, that's probably where you should start. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's easiest to think about it when people think, oh, I'm going to go work with an MSP or outsource my technical stuff, whether they have their own in-house or not. It gets muddy in their head. But I'll use myself as an example. The day came, Rashad said, hey, Tony, I want you to be the CIO of Integris. I already worked at the company, but I didn't have that same level of responsibility before I was a CIO. What's the first thing I did as a CIO? I, I went and did my own assessment, right? I went, I wanted to get rid of the blind spots. I needed to understand what I had and what those gaps were. And what's the next thing to work on so that I could present to the board, here's a plan. This is where we are today. This is where I want to take us. And here's the six steps in between. It's going to cost some money here. It's going to take some time there, but this is the plan. And so it all started with day one, Tony Rashad says, Tony, you're the CIO now. Okay. What did I do? I did an assessment. So it's no different than that scenario. When we come in, we bring our VCIO in or we bring our, and for me to do the assessment, I brought technical people with me, right? I brought my guys with me and said, let's assess this. Let's figure out what we should work on next so that we're operationally effective and secure at the same time. It was the exact same thing for me. And it's the exact same thing as we come into a new client. And um, I don't blame that director of IT. That director of IT is working on one client all the time. Hey, look, client, that's the company he works for. It's not a client. But that, that creates a little bit of a narrow focus. We have the advantage of seeing thousands of companies and involved in our industry and all the conferences and all the stuff we touch around technology universe and security landscape. Like we have to be involved in that and we get to be with thousands and thousands of companies. We're going to see a few more things in that director of IT. That's just the nature of our business. And by the way, that's one of my favorite things about being part of MSP space. It's just, yeah. we get to see a lot in it means we have to solve a lot of problems, but that's what we're good at. Absolutely. I think somebody was telling me the other day, the pace of the MSP business compared to LIT is significantly different. So yeah, we're just running at a different pace. Final one I just want to shoot around on. I actually don't have a direct answer on, but basically if I am a CFO or in the financial house or anybody really, it could be, how do I hold my IT organization, whether internal, external, accountable, what KPIs should I be looking at? When I first saw this question, I didn't have a direct answer and I was pondering on a few. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw it over to you first before I say anything on it. That's a good question. I'm a big fan of accountability in general. I think of all the KPIs we use internally. And so my brain goes right there. So I'm trying to actually think about it from the seat of the CFO or from the client. First one I went to was actually CSAT. So your provider, I don't know if internal IT teams would have this, but most MSPs probably have some sort of customer satisfaction tool that they're utilizing or should be utilizing on a ticket by ticket basis or a request by request basis. And I'd want to know that. I want to know how you feel about you guys. And we do measure that. So that's good. And that is one of the internal ones, right? Are our people making the clients happy, right? And actually delivering the service that they're paying for. I think that's a good one. Yeah, the, another good sign of the relationship is healthy is when service need that day-to-day -day help desk type tickets are on a slow decline. Like that, I would actually, I watch that internally, by the way, as I'm executing that plan that I brought to the board of directors and said, Hey, this is what we're doing. And then the guys are actually executing on that plan. I'm expecting that the needs of our staff internally are going to decrease over time. If my plan was good and we're executing it correctly, um, those day-to-day -day kind of emergency response, reactive type stuff should be decreasing over time. And time is a year and a half. It depends on your plan, right? If you have a plan that's one month, okay, it should, you should see it quickly. But most plans like this, you're, we're talking budgets, which are annual budgets. You're talking about even possibly multi-year plans. That's when you start to see that decrease. If, if we've been able to present the plan, 
we've gotten approval. The board of directors has approved said plan and we're at now executing on that plan. That's actually one that, like I said, I watch that internally. And I think that's something a client could expect from us as well. Absolutely. That, that they're really getting their money's worth. Not in that obvious day to day, but when that does come, then yes, the client should be happy with us. And then that'd be a CSAT. Yeah. Final thought on this conversation that I just was thinking about was we always had a, st- a saying that the companies we want to work with are the companies that think technology, think of technology more as an employee benefit than they do as a cost cost center. And I think if CFOs, and almost a lot of times HR potentially rolls up to a CFO as well, there's a lot of hats that the financial side has to wear. But if you start to think about that too, of the employees that I'm trying to attract, what do they want to see out of this? Do they constantly want to be down? Do they want to work for an employer that's constantly behind the curve or they're constantly begging for new issued stuff? For me personally, even though I live in this world, it's super cool to me when Tony or one of his team members comes to me and is like, Hey, Anthony, your device is old. We need to replace it. And, and to me, I'm just like, Hey, I'm just using the device. We're good. I don't notice anything, but the proactiveness to me of that is like a phenomenal employee experience. I can't necessarily put a dollar amount on that. I don't know if it's an employee turnover. I don't know what you would attribute a cost structure to that. But it is a different way of thinking about IT and cybersecurity is, you know, what is the employee experience? Is it helping you attract employees? Is it helping you retain employees? And is it allowing your employees to better serve your clients or make the organization more money? So just the- Yeah, this is an awesome topic. In most in most PL statements, technology is in the GA category, right? It, this is a general and administrative cost, right? Like it, those words are baked into the PL statement. Now, in some cases, it's cost of goods sold and it's a little bit different and that depends on industry and, and we could dig into there, but a CFO would love to have that conversation. Because that those words are baked into to a P&L statement, the companies often think eh, it's just a cost. It's just one more thing I have to do that I don't want to do. It's taken away from my profits or my board of directors or my investors' profits. That's all true, technically. However, I think people can rethink this and they can say, okay, that might be true. It is an expense, but what are the gains I get out of it? And maybe it's up into the gross margin. I get more efficiency, right? Because People are dealing with downtime or they're not dealing with garbage equipment or they're dealing with security incidences. They're able to do their job. And so now we start to talk about operational efficiencies. And as we know, operational efficiencies affect gross margin. And gross margin is where that starts before we get to the GA expenses. I'm leaving the sales guys out of there for you. <laughs> but if we can rethink that and go, yes, it's going to cost me a dollar down here but I'm going to gain a buck 50 up there. Now, all of a sudden we're starting to talk CFO language and that is hard to uh, quantify. Some of our CFO clients might be able to do that a little better than we can because they know their specific business better, but they might be able to say, Hey, downtime for this person is going to cost me X dollars an hour and they can do the math. And if that X dollars an hour equals the price of a new laptop, which is easy to get to, right? Even some of the best laptops are less than $2,000. If you're going to take a $2,000 hit to gross margin, then you might as well just spend it in GA and not take the hit up there. And if it's multiple times in a time frame of a laptop, say three to four years, then this is really a no-brainer. And when we start to talk about these things in those terms to a CFO, they're like, ah, I'm on board, I get it. You talk about it from a recruiting standpoint, which is also very interesting, right? The workforce is constantly changing as new generations come in and maybe older generations were, they understood that a computers were gonna go down and that was fine for a day. They had their paper backups, but newer generations, Google doesn't go down, right? Like they, they're used, they can get to YouTube all the time. And so therefore they come into a workplace and they just expect that everything in a workplace is gonna be at that same level. When it's not, you take somewhat of a reputational hit. You're like, this place is garbage. Or 
on your first day, you get handed a three and a half year old laptop, that's going to have an impact on your reputation or the expectations that brand new employee is going to have. If a client also, or one of our companies that we work for was, could use it as marketing. Hey, when you come on, this is what you're going to be using as your equipment today or on the first day. And you use it as a marketing tool in that sense. So there's lots of angles. If the company is willing to reframe the conversation in their own minds and even in the way they look at it on the P&L state. Love it. Tony, thanks for taking the time to do this well-versed conversation around CFOs, CIOs, and technology and cyber in general. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is a fun conversation. All right.